Welcome to another wonderful episode of Aaron's Audio Corner. Uh, this series of videos is going to be based on providing you with an explanation of what the data means. I started this website and this YouTube channel approximately a year ago. The entire purpose was to provide you with data. The reason I wanted to provide you with data was so you wouldn't have to rely on just my subjective opinion. Now, certainly I listen to the speakers when I test them out and I still tell you what I hear when I listen to them in the, in the various fashions, you know, living room, uh, home theater room, near field, far field, all sorts of different levels. And I try to test them out all sorts of ways. That way I try to, you know, encompass what everybody else is probably going to be listening like. Um, but the problem with just providing you with subjective feedback is Sometimes what I hear may not translate to what you hear. We may be listening for different things. You know, we may have a history of picking up on low frequency elements and somebody else may have a history of picking up on high frequency elements. Some people may have high frequency hearing loss. So when I provide you with this subjective information, I want to have objective data to go along with that because the idea is over time, when I provide more and more data, you can start to hone in on, hey, this is the sound that I like, or I prefer a reference sound, and this is the best value to get that, or one of the best ways to get that. And then there's certainly other factors as well, like looks, you know, the, the size of the speaker, all these things go together. But the objective data is absolutely important, and it's important to help you weed through all the fluff, because there's tons of audio reviewers out there that just tell you, uh, the mid-range sounds warm or the tweeters sound detailed. And it's just, it's superfluous. And I don't think that in the long run, that is as helpful as seeing data and being able to understand what the data means. It doesn't mean that you have to become an objectivist. It simply means that you're educated. Each of my videos tend to run a little bit long because I feel compelled to explain to you what the data means. And in doing so, it just, it naturally takes a while to get through everything because I also feel the need to break things down on a more elementary level. So I decided to take my own advice. I'm going to create this series of videos to tell you what the data means. And then this way you can come back to it when you look at one of my reviews and you're curious about, you know, what that means. I can just simply point you back to it. I can provide a link in the description somewhere and say, Hey, if you're curious about how to read this data and understand it at a more thorough level, see this series, see this playlist. So, the first video I'm going to kick off in this series is going to be frequency response, because in my opinion, that is the absolute most important aspect of objective data. Without a clear understanding of on axis frequency response, you really don't have a grasp on what all the other measurements mean. So let's get to that. Before we go any further, I want to clear one thing up. Anechoic response is not the same thing as measured in room response. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's simply, a lot of people will provide you a measurement of what they are getting in their room. And then somebody will say, oh, I don't like flat in-room response, you know, and they misunderstand that in-room response is totally different from an anechoic measurement. And an anechoic measurement is without the room influence, uh, you know, the ceiling, floor, walls, any of those reflections, couch, anything nearby that would mess up the frequency response measurement. The reason that you want to separate the speaker from the room is because you want to know exactly what the speaker is doing all on its own. And the reason you want to do that is because with enough data, you can predict how a speaker is going to perform in everybody else's room with a high degree of accuracy. And that's very important. I'll point that out because people will talk about in-room measurements as if the same thing as an anechoic measurement. And they are two totally, totally separate things. They could not be further from different. The majority of the data that I provide is based on a standard, which is this. It is the ANSI CTA standard, standard method of measurement for in-home loudspeakers, CTA 2034-A and revision 2020, I guess is what this stands for. Frankly, I don't know. But this document is free to download. I will provide a link in the description below. And uh, you just go to the website and you give them your information. They'll send you a download link. You can download it and go check it out. And it has everything that I'm going to talk about in this video, except for a few things, uh, which will be, you know, distortion and compression. But for the most part, everything that I'm going to talk about in this series of videos is going to be covered in this document, starting with the on-axis frequency response. And we're going to grab from them the direct definition of 
on axis response. Since the contents in this video are focused on on axis sound, let me give you an example of what I mean by on axis. This is a speaker. The speaker is facing right at you. That means the speaker is on axis. If I turn the speaker to the side, any direction, that means it is off axis. Even pointed down would be off axis. There's always a reference plane. Typically with most speakers, the reference plane is the tweeter. And by reference plane, I mean, where are you putting your ears at? Like level wise, you know, if I put my ears right here, then vertically, my ears are on axis with the reference plane. Now, if I put the speaker up here and turn it down, then I'm not on axis with the vertical plane anymore. So that's just briefly what I mean by on axis. And we'll talk about off axis in a later video. Here we are. This is the standards definition for it. And I'll read it out to you. The on axis frequency response is the universal starting point, And in many situations, it is a fair representation of the first sound to arrive at a listener's ears. To kick off this conversation, I'm going to use an example from a recent test I did on the Kali IN5. This is a graphic that has a lot of information in it, but we're going to focus right now on the black line that says on axis, which kind of runs through here. First of all, how do you, how do you read this graph? Well, on the X axis down here is frequency and on the Y axis is SPL. <laughs> what does that mean? Frequency. Everybody knows bass. You know bass. You hear the car thumping next to you at the red light. Your friends are talking about their subwoofers. Everybody understands what bass is. Bass is low frequency. Most people's voices cover the span of about 200 to 3000 Hertz. So you're talking about this area right in here. That's, that's the typical vocal region for males and females. And certainly there are some exceptions. When you go into the higher frequencies, which is generally considered, you know, one, two kilohertz and above going to the right, that would be sounds of like birds chirping or a whistle or the S as somebody's talking. And then when you're talking about how much there is, that would be covered on this left axis. So for example, if I'm talking quietly, then the output would be in a lower value of SPL. And if I'm talking loudly, the output would be at a higher volume of SPL. And that's the basics of a frequency response graph. When you're talking about loudspeakers, ideally what you want is to not mess with the signal coming out of whatever your playback system is. So for example, you've got a CD, it's got a song on it. And let's say the song is just a sound sweep. And it's that you probably heard a sound sweep before it goes whoop, and that's it, right? Um, if the CD has just a sound sweep on it, then the speakers should play just the sound sweep only, and it should play it with the same fidelity that is on the actual CD medium. And that would be, you know, A equals B, input equals output. Unfortunately, there is no loudspeaker in the world that I'm aware of that will provide you with that exact thing because there is no perfect loudspeaker. A perfect loudspeaker would be a speaker that has a very flat line from 20 Hertz down here to 20 kilohertz up here, because that's mostly the typical listener's hearing range. When a loudspeaker gets outside of that flat line, as everyone that I'm aware of does, that's when they start to impart their own sonic characteristics to the sound, whether good or bad. Some people, for example, may like a boosted high frequency response. So the high frequencies tend to sound a little bit louder than the lows. Some people like the opposite. Some people may want heightened vocals, so they may want more SPL in the 200 hertz to three kilohertz region. So in this ballpark area right here. But the bottom line again is that there is no speaker on earth that is dead flat from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, at least that I'm aware of. And if there is, then that would probably be considered the reference standard in terms of on axis response. This graphic represents the same black line that you saw on the previous graphic. However, it's just by itself. I've got rid of all the other ones. And what I've done here is I've calculated the mean SPL over a range of 300 Hertz to three kilohertz. So basically, you know, the typical human voice region. And in doing so, I've also said, okay, now based on that mean SPL, what is the plus or minus one and a half dB region? And then what is the plus or minus three dB region? The reason I've done that is to help you visualize how good the speaker's linearity is. And when I say linearity, I just mean, you know, how flat is the response on axis? A speaker that is within plus or minus one and a half dB is really a good speaker. A speaker that is within, you know, plus or minus three dB is a good speaker, but it's not the greatest of the great. 
And when you get beyond that, that's when you start having issues with, you know, speakers really tainting the sound and creating their own imbalance in terms of timbre. You know, what you hear, the, the vocals may sound louder than the high frequencies or vice versa, or just any kind of imbalance overall to the speaker response. And what I'm looking for here really is a on-axis response that is well within the gray window, within limits. When I say within limits, what do I mean? Well, you know, most bookshelf speakers, they're not gonna have a lot of bass. So you're gonna expect to see some kind of roll off here, what you do. And, you know, below what, 50 Hertz or so, this speaker just doesn't have a lot of output. That's typical. When you're talking floor standard speakers, you're, you're bound to get more output with the lower frequencies, but they still have their limits for the most part as well. And generally speaking, no matter what speaker you use, floor stander or bookshelf speaker, you're still going to want to buy a good subwoofer to hold up and shore up the low frequency response. Using this speaker as an example, you can see that it is mostly within the one and a half dB window, but it does jump outside of that at a few points and gets into the plus or minus three dB window. And then when you get to the very high frequencies, it is even outside of the plus or minus three dB window. And you may be wondering, are these effects audible? Yes, they are. If you want to know what I thought about how the speaker sounded and how the high frequency, you know, anomalies impacted what I heard, then make sure you go check out that review and I will make sure to put it somewhere up in the cards if I remember to. And that's it for the frequency response video. Like I said, I wanted to keep this one short and sweet. And when there are issues with the frequency response of speakers that I've measured, I will make sure to try to note those as I go through the review. Hopefully that helps explain frequency response a little bit to you. And if you've got any questions, make sure you ask in the comments below.